Artifacts indicating human activity dating back to the early Stone Age have been found in the Kingdom of Eswatini known as Swaziland for most of its history. Prehistoric rock art paintings date from c. 25,000 BC and continuing up to the 19th century can be found in various places around the country. The country now derives its name from a later king named Swati II. JN, named for NG Wayne III, is an alternative name for Swaziland the surname of whose royal house remains Nkosi de Lamini. Nkosi literally means, King. Swati II was the greatest of the fighting kings of Swaziland, and he greatly extended the area of the country to twice its current size. The Emakonzambili clans were initially incorporated into the kingdom with wide autonomy, often including grants of special ritual and political status. The extent of their autonomy however was drastically curtailed by Swati, who attacked and subdued some of them in the 1850s. With his power, Swati greatly reduced the influence of the Emakonzambili while incorporating more people into his kingdom either through conquest or by giving them refuge. These later arrivals became known to the Swazis as Emafikamava. The clans like the Mabokanes and others who accompanied the Dalamini kings were known as the Bemjabuko or True Swazi. The autonomy of the Swaziland nation was influenced by British and Dutch rule of Southern Africa in the 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1881 the British government signed a convention recognizing Swazi independence despite the scramble for Africa that was taking place at the time. This independence was also recognized in the Convention of 1884. However, because of controversial land, mineral rights and other concessions, Swaziland had a triumviral administration in 1890 following the death of King Mabanzeni in 1889. This government represented the British, the Dutch republics and the Swazi people. Finally, in 1894, a convention placed Swaziland under the South African Republic as a protectorate. This continued under the rule of N. G. Wayne V. until the outbreak of the Second Boer War in October 1899. King N. G. Wayne V died in December 1899 during Inkwala after the outbreak of the Boer War when his successor, Sabuza, was only four months old. Swaziland was indirectly involved in the war with various skirmishes between the British and the Boers occurring in the country until 1902. In 1903, after British victory in the Anglo-Boer War, Swaziland became a British protectorate. Much of its early administration for example, postal services being carried out from South Africa until 1906 when the Transvaal colony was granted self-government. Following this, Swaziland was partitioned into European and non-European or native reserves areas with the former being two-thirds of the total land. Sabuza's official coronation was in December 1921 after the regency of Labatsabeni after which he led an unsuccessful deputation to the Privy Council in London in 1922 regarding the issue of the land. In the period between 1923 and 1963, Sabuza established the Swazi Commercial Amadota which was to grant licenses to small businesses on the Swazi reserves and also established the Swazi National School to counter the dominance of the missions in education. His stature grew with time and the Swazi royal leadership was successful in resisting the weakening power of the British administration and the incorporation of Swaziland into the Union of South Africa. The Constitution for Independent Swaziland was promulgated by Britain in November 1963 under the terms of which legislative and executive councils were established. This development was opposed by the Swazi National Council, Litko. Despite such opposition, elections took place and the first Legislative Council of Swaziland was constituted on 9 September 1964. Changes to the original constitution proposed by the Legislative Council were accepted by Britain and a new constitution providing for a House of Assembly and Senate was drawn up. Elections under this constitution were held in 1967. Swaziland was briefly a protected state until Britain granted it full independence in 1968. Following the elections of 1973, the constitution of Swaziland was suspended by King Sabuza II who thereafter ruled the country by decree until his death in 1982. At this point Sabuza II had ruled Swaziland for 83 years, making him the longest ruling monarch in history. A regency followed his death, with Queen Regent Jaliwa Shangwe being head of state until 1984 when she was removed by Litko and replaced by Queen Mother Nt Ombi Twala. Swati III, the son of Nt Ombi, was crowned king on 25 April 1986 as king and Ingwanyama of Swaziland. 
early settlements by Swazis until 1700s. The earliest known inhabitants of the region were Khoisan hunter-gatherers. They were largely replaced by the Kashian hunter tribe during Bantu migrations who hailed from the Great Lakes regions of eastern and central Africa. Evidence of agriculture and iron use dates from about the 4th century and people speaking languages ancestral to current Sotho and Nguni languages began settling no later than the 11th century. The Swazi settlers, then known as the Ng Wayne or Bakingwane, before entering Swaziland had been settled on the banks of the Pongola River and prior to that in the area of the Tembe River near present-day Maputo. Continuing conflict with the Ndwandwe people pushed them further north, with Ng Wayne III establishing his capital at Shizilweni at the foot of the Mh Lashini Hills. Under Sabuza I, the Ng Wayne people eventually established their capital at Zambose in the heartland of present-day Swaziland. In this process, they conquered and incorporated the long established clans of the country known to the Swazi as Emakon Zambili. The early Swazis Bemjabuko lived around the present day Tembe River near Maputo, Mozambique. Dlamini I was able to increase his followers by conquering many clans along the Labombo after departure from Tembe. As part of the Naguni expansion southwards, the Swazis crossed the Limpopo River and settled in southern Tongaland today in southern Mozambique near Maputo in the late 15th century. The Ng Wayne people are recorded as having entered the present territory of Swaziland around the year 1600. Topic: <laughs> Consolidation of the Swazi Nation 1740s-1868. Thereafter during the leadership of Ng Wayne III Swazis settled present-day Swaziland. These Swazis first settled north of the Pongola River. The Ng Wayne Kingdom was thus established during the rule of Ng Wayne III from around 1745 until 1780. The early Swazi people emigrated from the Labombo Mountains where Swazi rulers were established, to the banks of the Pongola River. The leader, Ng Wayne III established the Swazi settlements here near the Ndwandwe kingdom. Swazis were in constant conflict with their neighbors, the Ndwandwes. The capital of Ng Wayne III was in southern Swaziland in Shizilweni at the foot of the Mh Lashini Mountains near Nh Langano and Mahamba. Swazis established a polity based on kingship accompanied by queen mothers and during the minority of a crown prince a queen regent. Thus when Ng Wayne died, Layaka Ndwandwe became queen regent until Ndv Ungunye became the king. The kingship of Ndv Ungunye continued the order established by Ng Wayne III from 1780 until 1815 when he was killed by lightning. He was succeeded by Ng Wayne IV after the regency of queen regent Lomvula Mnd Zebel. Ng Wayne IV was also known as Sabuza I and Somlolo a revered king of Swaziland. Sabuza continued to expand the territory of Swaziland. The conflict of Swaziland and the Ndwandwe Kingdom led Somalolo also known as Sabuza I and Ng Wayne IV to move his capital from Zambose in Shizilweni to the center of Swaziland at another kraal called Zambose. Somalolo who became king in 1815 consolidated the order of the Ng Wayne state by incorporating the Emakon Zambili clans into his kingdom adding to the Bemjabuko or true Swazi. Somalolo was a strategic leader between 1815 and 1839 a period including the Mifakane period of Shaka Zulu a Zulu illegitimate child of Senzangakona who created his kingdom from the M. Tetwa polity established by Dingusweo. Sabuza used his diplomatic skills to avoid conflict with Shaka by allying with him when it suited him. As a result, Swaziland was left unaffected by the Mifakane Wars. Somalolo was succeeded in 1839 by his son Swati II who is known as the greatest of the Swazi fighting kings. Swati inherited an area which extended as far as present-day Barberton in the north and included the Nomahasha district in the Portuguese territory of Mozambique. Swati continued to expand Swazi territory and the clans added to the nation were considered Emifikamava. During his reign the territory of Swaziland was expanded northward and his capital was at Hoho in the northern part of Swaziland. Swati improved the military organization of the regiments in Swaziland. His regiment was Inyatsi and he danced the sacred Inkwala at Hoho instead of the common Ezelwini Valley as his predecessors. Swati was a powerful king who attacked other African tribes to acquire cattle and captives. 
Within Swaziland, his force was used to limit the power of the Emakonzambili chiefs. Swati made land grants in 1855 to the Leidenberg Republic though the wording of the sale is vague. The Boers at the time were fairly weak and could not act upon the land concession. Swati continued to fight with other African tribes across the land and beyond in areas such as Zoutpansberg and Orgstad. His death in 1868 brought about an end to the conquest by the Swazi kings. Swati was succeeded by Ludvanga, however he died in his youth and as a result Mabanzeni was chosen by the Swazis council instead. <laughs> Settlements and concessionaires 1868-1899 Swazi contact with European began when Dutch Trekboer reached the western hinterland of Swaziland in the 1840s. By 1845 about 300 Boer families had settled in Oristed with more families in Leidenburg. Two deeds of sale dated 1846 and 1855 indicate the sale of Swazi territory to the Dutch republics for a sum of 170 cattle. These deeds at face value seem to surrender the whole of the Swazi territory to the Dutch. Following the death of King Swati II in 1868, a period of regency followed with Queen Regent Sanzile and Dwandwe until 1875. The South African Republic in 1868 attempted to annex Swaziland by a proclamation. Mabanzeni, following the death of his half-brother, the Crown Prince Ludvanga in 1872, was chosen by Inkasakati Lamgadala Kumalo as her adopted son and hence a Crown Prince. However threats existed from Prince Mabalini who had married one of Ntengu Mabokane's daughters, and Mabanzani's half-brother and one of the sons of Swati who was a pretender to the throne and allied with the Zulu King Setshwayo. However, he never became successful. The British prevented any attacks from Setshwayo who had been crowned by Sir Theophilus Shepstone. In addition, the Transvaal Boers wanted to assert their authority over Swaziland by supporting Mabanzani. Indeed, in Mabanzani's coronation Rudolf, the resident magistrate of Ladysmith and former Landrost of Utrecht in the company of about 350 burghers and 70 wagons, attended the ceremony. During this period, the Transvaal was annexed by Britain. In 1879, the same year as the Zulu War, Mabanzani aided the British who were now controlling the Transvaal to defeat Sekokun and dismantle his kingdom. In return for his assistance, Swaziland's independence was to be guaranteed perpetually and Swaziland would be protected from Boer and Zulu encroachment. In 1881 the Pretoria Convention establishing the British suzerainty over the Transvaal state, Article 24 guaranteed the independence of Swaziland, its boundary and Swazi people in their country as recognised by both Britain and the Transvaal. Under this convention, the Swazi territory was reduced in size, leaving Swazi people as residents of the Transvaal Territory in what is today Mpumalanga Province in South Africa. The London Convention of 1884's Article 12 continued to recognise Swaziland as an independent country with Mabanzeni as its king. However, in the years between 1885 and 1889, as more concessions were granted, the population of Europeans in Swaziland increased. Unease with some concessionaires led to Mabanzeni to request British intervention. In addition to this, Boer encroachments especially in 1887 increased the intensity of these requests. The situation in the country continued to deteriorate as some raids, cattle rustling and stealing of children from Swazi villages by Boers continued. Britain refused intervention on the grounds that there was presence of European residents not of British extraction and concessions held at the time by the South African Republic in areas such as tax collection, postal services which should be in the control of a state government. On the 18th of December 1889 after Mabanzani's death, the Swazi government, represented by the Queen Regent Tabatina Kambule and the Swazi Council made a proclamation. In this appointing Sir Theophilus Shepstone and two other officers representing the South African Republic and Britain and a provisional council to oversee administration of the country especially concession and affairs of European residents of the country. A concessions court was established to see which concessions were valid and which were dubious. The organic proclamation was followed by the London Convention of 1894 which settled the matter over Swaziland. The Swazi proclamation supporting this convention was resisted for a while since its proposal in 1893 and was signed by the Queen Regent and Swazi Council on December 1894. 
In this convention, the status of Swaziland, its people and the kings were recognized as in the 1884 convention. However, for the administrative affairs of Swaziland it would be a protected state of the Transvaal Republic with guarantees on the rights of Swazi people in their country and their system of governance. This administration, led by Krog, went on until the Anglo-Boer War started in 1899. N. G. Wayne V. who had been chosen as Crown Prince following Mabanzani's death in 1889 was crowned in 1895 after the London Convention. In 1898, he was allegedly responsible for the death of his advisor Mbaba Nsi Bands and two of his aides. In response he was charged with the crime and during this time he fled to British Zululand returning on guaranteed for his safety. On his return he was charged with a lesser crime of public disturbance and was fined £500. In addition, his judicial powers were reduced. The next year in October 1899 the Anglo-Boer War began. This led to the discontinuity of Transvaal administration of Swaziland's affairs. Ngwanyama Ng Wayne V, however ruled until December of that year when he died while dancing the sacred Inkwala. <inaudible> Anglo-Boer War <inaudible> Swaziland was indirectly involved in the Second Boer War <inaudible> The beginning of the conflict found it administrated by the South African Republic, with the colonial headquarters set at Bremersdorp. In September, 1899, with war considered imminent, the colonists started evacuating the area. N. G. Wayne V. of Swaziland Bunu was informed that the area would be left in his care during the absence of the white residents. The Swaziland police under Sergeant Opperman started practicing for war while issuing rifles and ammunition to remaining burghers. On 4 October 1899, Special Commissioner Krogh issued an official notice of evacuation for all white inhabitants, with the exception of burghers eligible for active service. Most of the British subjects were escorted towards the border with Mozambique, women and other South African civilians were left heading for various destinations. People with dual nationality were still subject to the draft, though unwilling to fight against their own people. Several of them escaped towards Mozambique or the colony of Natal. It was not long before skirmishes involved the Swaziland forces. On 28 October 1899, the newly formed Swaziland Commando Unit moved against a British police post at Kualiweni. The South African unit counted about 200 burghers, while the outpost only had 20 men. Bunu managed to warn the police post of the approaching attack. The police retreated towards Ingwavama, seat of a magistrate. The commandos burned the abandoned post and a nearby shop to the ground. Then Joachim Ferreira led them towards Ingwavama. The village was not better guarded and had to also be evacuated. The Swaziland commando burned it to the ground, while the magistrate and his people escaped to Nongoma. Meanwhile, the Swazi people had been warned by Piet Joubert to remain calm and not involve themselves in the conflict. Bunu instead found himself unrestricted from colonial authorities for the first time. He soon felt free to settle old scores with political enemies. News of the violent deaths of diplomat Minkonkoni Kunin and several others in time reached the Boer forces involved in the siege of Ladysmith. Several of the dead had close ties to the colonial authorities. Joubert had to assure worried commanders that Swaziland was not turning against them. Indeed, spies reported that Bunu feared he had been bewitched. He was striking against whomever he suspected of the deed. On 10 December 1899, Bunu died due to a serious illness. He had blamed it on sorcery, though contemporaries suspect it was alcohol-induced. His mother Labatsabeni M. D. Luli became regent. She set about eliminating the surviving advisors and favorites of Bunu. Swazi regiments were roaming the country during the internal conflicts. The South African authorities were worried that the violence could expand towards the southwestern border of Swaziland, where Boer farms were cultivated by women and children. They had the farms evacuated and the population transferred to Piet Retief. The farmers from Piet Retief, Wackerstrom and their vicinities had made a practice of trekking their ship into Swaziland for winter grazing. In January 1900, Francis William Wrights, the State Secretary of the South African Republic, started issuing orders discouraging any sheep herders from entering Swaziland. On 18 April 1900, any such entry was forbidden. The Swaziland Commando were by that point far from their initial home base, fighting along the Tugela River. The British had their own concerns about Swaziland. 
They suspected that supplies from Mozambique could be smuggled to the Boers through Swaziland. Queen Regent Labatsabeni was however attempting to maintain neutrality in the wider conflict, preoccupied with securing the throne. Her grandson Sabuza II of Swaziland was underage and there were other viable candidates for the throne among the House of Dlamini, in particular Prince Masimf. Masimf was a cousin of Bunu and had been a rival candidate for the throne since 1889. His line of the family maintained close relations with the Boers, the prince himself having been educated at Pretoria. By May, 1900, the Queen was worried that the Boers would intervene against her in case of a succession dispute. She opened communications with the restored magistrate of Ingwavama, arranging to flee to his area if needed. Her messages were passed to the government of Natal and from there to Cape Town, the capital of the Cape Colony. A reply by Johannes Smuts assured her that the British had not forgotten about the Swazi and British representatives would reliably return to Swaziland at an early date. The message might have reflected Smuts' own ambitions but his authority on such matters was rather questionable. But Frederick Roberts, Baron Roberts, a high-ranking military officer, was also convinced to start diplomatic contacts with the Queen. His representatives were to persuade the Queen Regent of three things, first, the need to prevent the Boers from occupying the mountains of the area, secondly, the necessity of formally appealing for British protection, and third, to make clear that the indiscriminate murders in Swaziland would have to end. The British contacts with the Swazi played a role in advance of their siege of Komataport, a nearby South Africa icon stronghold. In September 1900, once the town fell, the British were able to capture Barberton and its area. A number of Boers fled into Swaziland, only to have the Swazi disarm them and confiscate their cattle. The end of South African presence in the area left open the question of what to do with Swaziland. Smuts had been campaigning since May to convince the British authorities to place Swaziland under their administration. By September, Smuts had gained some support from civil authorities but not from military ones, since Roberts did not want to devote any of his forces to an invasion or occupation of the area. Nevertheless, Smuts attempted some diplomatic contacts with the Swazi, which were not particularly successful. The individual Smuts met for discussions refused to give any information on the internal affairs of Swaziland or Boer activities. The fall of Komataport directly resulted in increased importance of Swaziland for the Boers. To maintain their communications with diplomatic and trade contacts in Laurenko Marcus, Mozambique, the Boers had to send messengers through Swaziland. This was difficult, since British forces were allowed to pass through certain Swazi areas. By November 1900, the Queen was able to assure both Roberts and Smuts that she was doing her best to drive Boers out of her country. A few armed burghers and their African allies, hostile to her government, were still active at times. On November 29, 1900, Roberts was relieved of his command. His replacement was Herbert Kitchener, Baron Kitchener of Khartoum. By late December, Smuts contacted the military secretary office of Kitchener concerning the Swaziland situation. Smuts had secured the position of resident commissioner of Swaziland, though the British had no actual authority over the area. He attempted to convince Kitchener it was time to establish a permanent military presence in Swaziland and put Smuts in charge of the area. Kitchener had a different view. Starting his own correspondence with Labatsabeni, Kitchener insisted on three points, first, the Swazi were still required to not take part in the war, second, no British forces would be sent into Swaziland unless the area faced a Boer invasion, and third, the Swazis were now directly under the authority of the British Crown, owing their loyalty to Victoria of the United Kingdom. In December 1900 to January 1901, there were reports that retreating Boers were attempting to flee through Swaziland. Eight British columns were sent to either force the Boer commandos to surrender or flee to Swaziland. A certain column under Horace Smith Dorian proceeded all the way to the Swaziland border, managing to capture several Boer wagons and large numbers of cattle and sheep on February 9, 1901. Most of the captured Boers were sent to the concentration camp of Volksrust. On February 11, another column under Edmund Allenby was positioned at the southern border of Swaziland. On February 14, Smith Dorian's forces reached Amsterdam. There he was contacted by envoys of the Queen Regent, requesting aid in driving the Boers off her land. In response, the Imperial Light Horse and the Suffolk Regiment were sent into Swaziland, joined by armed Swazis. The two regiments were able to capture about 30 Boers in an initial skirmish. However, heavy rains soon slowed their advance through the country. 
On February 28, 1901, 200 other men of the British Mounted Infantry entered Swaziland. Under Lieutenant Col. Henry, this force managed to locate and capture the transport convoy of the Piet Retief Commandos. About 65 Boers were captured in the operation. The remnants of the commandos retreated towards the southern border of Swaziland, only to be captured by the British forces stationed there. By early March, Smith Dorian noted that the Swazis were pillaging Boer residences. By this time, Allenby had reached Mahamba and set up camp there. Henry was pursuing another Boer wagon convoy, and Queen Regent Labatsabeni was ordering her impis to clear their land from the Boers. Henry eventually managed to return to Derby with several prisoners, while Allenby and his forces reached the vicinity of Halatakulu. The Berthers had to limit themselves to the hills of southwestern Swaziland. Surviving accounts from the Devonshire Regiment indicate that the Swazis were acting as a ninth column, commanded by the Queen of the Swazis. On March 8, 1901, remnants of the Piet Retief commandos, accompanied by women and children, were attacked by forces supposedly under Chief N.T. Shingila Similano. The latter consisted of about 40 men, including two riflemen. Thirteen burghers and one African guide were killed, several wounded, and the others were scattered. Some of the survivors later surrendered to the 18th Hussars. N.T. Shingila later denied any involvement in the massacre. In any case, the incident terrified several other Boers. Between March 8 and 11, about 70 burghers and various women and children chose to surrender to Allenby rather than face the Swazis. The British nevertheless warned Labatsabeni to cease further massacres. On the 11th of April 1901, Louis Botha corresponded with Kitchener, complaining that British officers were inducing the Swazis to fight against the Boers. Claiming the result was the indiscriminate murders of burghers, women and children by Swazi commandos. Allenby attributed the killings partly to Swazi anxiety to counter Boer incursions into their territory and partly to their fear of Boer reprisals. That is what the Boers would do when the British eventually left. Allenby himself refused to allow large numbers of armed Swazis to join his column, though he still used a few of them as guides. Smuts finally entered Swaziland during this month, though unable to establish his authority over any British forces, the presence of regular British troops allowed the Queen Regent to present to them her concerns over an irregular unit, Steinacre's Horse, created early in the war as a unit of adventurers and mercenaries under British command, they were well known for looting Boer property. With the Boer increasingly impoverished, however, they had turned their attention to the cattle of the Swazi. Labatsabeni complained to both sides that this unit consisted of common robbers occupying Bremersdorp. Botha responded by sending a commando unit against the horse, with orders to avoid antagonizing the Swazi in any way. The Swazi National Council agreed to let them pass. Between July 21 and 23, 1901, the Ermelo commandos succeeded in forcing most of the Steinacre's horse. Forces to retreat, capturing about 35 men, killing or wounding a few and burning Bremersdorp to the ground. Both the British and the Boers continued to have access to Swaziland with occasional skirmishes occurring. On November 8, 1901, for example, the 13th Hussars captured 14 burghers near Mahamba. The skirmishes ended in February 1902 with the defeat of the final Boer unit in Swaziland. Topic. British rule over Swaziland 1906 to 1968 Throughout the colonial period from 1906 to 1968 Swaziland was governed by a resident commissioner who ruled according to decrees issued by the British High Commissioner for South Africa Such decrees were formulated in close consultation with the resident commissioners who in turn took informal and formal advice from white settler interests and the Swazi royalty in 1907 during the residency of Robert Corindon, Swazi land was partitioned into a third for Swazi nation land or reserves and the remaining two-thirds into crown and commercial land for European occupation. The partition was carried out in 1909 with Swazis living in European areas given five years to vacate the land. Topic. British resident commissioners in Swaziland In 1921 the British established Swaziland's first legislative body—a European Advisory Council EAC of elected white representatives mandated to advise the British High Commissioner on non-Swazi affairs. 
In 1944, the High Commissioner both reconstituted the basis and role of the EAC, and, over Swazi objections, issued a native authorities proclamation constituting the paramount chief or Ingwanyama and king to the Swazis, as the British called the king, as the native authority for the territory to issue legally enforceable orders to the Swazis subject to restrictions and directions from the resident commissioner. Under pressure from royal non-cooperation this proclamation was revised in 1952 to grant the Swazi paramount chief a degree of autonomy unprecedented in British colonial indirect rule in Africa. Also in 1921, after more than 20 years of regency headed by Queen Regent Labatsabeni, Sabuza II became Ingwanyama lion or head of the Swazi nation. In the early years of colonial rule, the British expected that Swaziland would eventually be incorporated into South Africa. After World War II, however, South Africa's intensification of racial discrimination induced the United Kingdom to prepare Swaziland for independence. Political activity intensified in the early 1960s. Several political parties were formed and jostled for independence and economic development. The largely urban parties had few ties to the rural areas, where the majority of Swazis lived. The traditional Swazi leaders, including King Sabuza II and his inner council, formed the Imbokodvo National Movement a political group that capitalized on its close identification with the Swazi way of life. Responding to pressure for political change, the colonial government scheduled an election in mid-1964 for the first legislative council in which the Swazis would participate. In the election, the INM and four other parties, most having more radical platforms, competed in the election. The INM won all 24 elective seats. Topic: Independence 1968 to 1980s. Leading up to independence, the INM had solidified its political base. Having done this, the INM incorporated many demands of the more radical parties, especially that of immediate independence. In 1966, the UK government agreed to discuss a new constitution. A constitutional committee agreed on a constitutional monarchy for Swaziland, with self-government to follow parliamentary elections in 1967. Swaziland became independent on September 6, 1968. Swaziland's first post-independence elections were held in May 1972. The INM received close to 75% of the vote. The NG Wayne National Liberatory Congress NNLC received slightly more than 20% of the vote which gained the party three seats in Parliament. In response to the NNLC's showing, King Sabuza repealed the 1968 Constitution on April 12, 1973 and dissolved Parliament. He assumed all powers of government and prohibited all political activities and trade unions from operating. He justified his actions as having removed alien and divisive political practices incompatible with the Swazi way of life. In January 1979, a new parliament was convened, chosen partly through indirect elections and partly through direct appointment by the king. King Sabuza II died in August 1982, and Queen Regent Jaliwa assumed the duties of the head of state. In 1984, an internal dispute led to the replacement of the Prime Minister and eventual replacement of Jaliwa by a new Queen Regent N. Tiombi. Tumi's only child, Prince Makassadev, was named heir to the Swazi throne. Real power at this time was concentrated in the Likko, a supreme traditional advisory body that claimed to give binding advice to the Queen Regent. In October 1985, Queen Regent N. Tiombi demonstrated her power by dismissing the leading figures of the Likko. Prince Makassadev returned from school in England to ascend to the throne and help end the continuing internal disputes. He was enthroned as Ingwanyama Swati III on April 25, 1986. Shortly afterwards he abolished the Litko. In November 1987, a new parliament was elected and a new cabinet appointed. Topic. Recent history 1980s and 1990s. Swati III is the present monarch of Swaziland since his coronation in 1986, and rules together with Queen Mother Nt Ombi Tf Wala. In 1986 Sachidilamini was appointed Prime Minister, taking over from Prince Bikimpi. In 1987, following a premature dissolution of parliament by the king, Swaziland held its third parliamentary election under the Tinkhuntla traditional system. 
In 1988 and 1989, an underground political party, the People's United Democratic Movement PUDEMO, criticized the king and his government, calling for «democratic reforms». In response to this political threat and to growing popular calls for greater accountability within government, the king and the prime minister initiated an ongoing national debate on the constitutional and political future of Swaziland. This debate produced a handful of political reforms, approved by the king, including direct and indirect voting, in the 1993 national elections. In this election, voters were registered, the constituencies were increased from 50 to 55, and the election were judged as free and fair. The economy and the population of Swaziland continued to grow in the 1980s. The average economic growth being 3.3% annual growth between 1985 and 1993. Annual population growth was at approximately 3% during the same period. Swaziland's 1980s economy continued to be dependent on South Africa, with 90% of imports coming from South Africa and 37% of exports going to South Africa. Swaziland, along with Lesotho, Botswana and South Africa continued to be members of the Southern African Customs Union State revenues were heavily dependent on the customs union's remittances which were between 48.3% and 67.1% between 1981 and 1987. The 1990s saw a rise in student and labor protests pressuring the king to introduce reforms. Thus, progress toward constitutional reforms began, culminating with the introduction of the current Swaziland constitution in 2005. This happened despite objections by political activists. The current constitution does not clearly deal with the status of political parties. The first election under the new constitution, took place in 2008. Members of parliament were elected from 55 constituencies also known as Tinkhundla. These MPs served five-year terms which ended in 2013. In 2011, Swaziland suffered an economic crisis, due to reduced SACU receipts. This led to the government of Swaziland to request a loan from neighboring South Africa. However, the Swazi government did not agree with the conditions of the loan, which included political reforms. During this period, there was increased pressure on the Swaziland government to carry out more reforms. Public protests by civic organizations and trade unions became more common. Improvements in SACU receipts from 2012 onwards, eased the fiscal pressure on the Swazi government. The new parliament, the second since promulgation of the constitution, was elected on 20 September 2013. This saw the reappointment of Sibisiso Delamini, by the king, as prime minister for the third time. In 1989, Satya Delamini was dismissed from his position as prime minister on 12 July 1989 and was replaced with a former Swaziland Federation of Trade Unions SFTU Secretary General, Obed Delamini. He was to be the premier until 1993 and succeeded by Prince Mabalini. During the tenure of both Obed and Mabalini there was growing labor militancy which culminated in a major general strike in 1997 led by the SFTU. Following the labor action, Prince Mabalini was replaced as prime minister by Sibisiso Delamini. On 19 April 2018, King Swati III announced that the Kingdom of Swaziland had renamed itself the Kingdom of Eswatini to mark the 50th anniversary of Swazi independence. The new name, Eswatini, means, Land of the Swazis, in the Swazi language, and was partially intended to prevent confusion with the similarly named Switzerland. See also History of Africa History of Lesotho History of South Africa History of Southern Africa List of monarchs of Eswatini Politics of Eswatini References External links Background note, Swaziland